All right, well, I thought I would begin by reading uh, the verse that we looked at this morning. I, I know we're only looking at verses 15 and 16 this evening, but it, it does give to us um, the connection that Paul's making with the word um, uh, but in verse 15, um, contrasting it with what he's just said and giving us a clue to what he means in verses 15 and 16. So beginning in verse 14, Paul writes to the Romans, And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. But I have written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. And again, let me just remind you, I mean, the, the, any passage of Scripture is far deeper than everything we'll be able to explore, but hopefully we'll, we'll get um, the point behind the, uh, why it is that Paul uh, admonishes, why God admonishes through his prophets, through the apostles, through um, his, his ministers, uh, why we are to admonish one another. The goal is Christ-likeness. Now, this morning, remember, Paul called us to admonish, to remind each other of certain things. Remember, the word admonish can mean warn, it can mean instruct, it, it has a, often a corrective uh, element to it, but it uh, certainly is meant to provide that, that pressure, that pressure that we need to move forward. You know, I, I, was, well, who was, I was talking with Cindy this morning about... Uh, you know, different forms of economics. You know, you've got uh, socialism and capitalism. And in socialism, you don't have any pressure to do anything. You know, you, you're, you're lazy because other people are working. But in capitalism, you have some incentive, you know, and you, you have this pressure that motivates you. Well, we need, we need pressure. We, you know, we need some motivation. And admonishment is that motivation. And uh, we are to be encouraging one another to embrace God's truth and to embrace his, his law, his, his way of doing things. If we should see someone going astray in either of these two areas, um, that, that they might, again, press forward in the Christian life. But let's not forget, Paul said, to do this, to do, to do it effectively, we have to be qualified. And the qualifications are, first of all, to be full of goodness, which means we need to be morally upright, uh, we need to be living the life God calls us to do. We have to deal with the logs in our own eyes before we try to help our neighbor. But we also need to be caring. We need to love those whom we're admonishing. Be concerned about what, what happens to them. Uh, you know, not just see them as another you know, notch, so to speak, on our Bibles. We've, we've checked the box. We've done the right thing. But... We need to care about them, we need to love them so we can approach them with the right kind of demeanor. As Paul says in Galatians uh, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, in a spirit of gentleness and love. Now we noted that we already have this love by the Spirit of God if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, but that love does need to mature. We have to have grown to the point where we can do this without really having the opposite effect on people, which is to push them away. Because it is so easy, especially today, to offend people. There, there has to be a great deal of love and concern. So, first of all, we need to be full of goodness. But secondly, we need to be full of knowledge. We need to know God's truth. We need to know the right way of thinking. We need to know the right way of doing things. The difference between what God says and what our opinions might be What's important enough to confront and really what isn't? We need to remember there are matters of Christian liberty and, and this section comes just right after that where we need to be concerned about the weaker brother, not use our liberty to offend them. And that means also not riding over them with our admonitions if they happen to get out of what we consider to be the right way to go. But that also takes time. 
to grow in knowledge, time in the Word, time studying as well as applying the Word to ourselves. Knowledge, maybe you've heard this, James, that John Frame used to say all the time, knowledge is application, right? The more you know how to apply a text, the more you understand about that text. So we need to grow in our understanding and our knowledge by applying it to ourselves until we gain the, the necessary knowledge and skill to see error and to be able to help others uh, find their way out of it. Now, that already uh, tells us what the purpose is behind admonition. You know, that's what we want to consider this evening. Why are we to admonish? We know it's our duty. We know we have examples. We know that this is what our Lord calls us to do through the Apostle Paul. But, but why? Well, Paul, I believe, tells us in verses 15 and 16, it's that we might be sanctified. You know, his goal was the sanctification of his hearers. Now, sanctification means to become uh, or be made uh, holy, to be separated from sin, from the things that God hates, that are hateful, to be separate, I mean, it means several different things, but, you know, it means as far as uh, being separated from the world to God, that we are a holy people. But sanctification, when it comes to us personally, means to be separated from sin to obedience, to the things that God loves uh, because we love Him. And if we could summarize it in, in a couple of words, it, it literally means to become like Christ, the Holy One of God. As we were admonished, you shall be holy for I am holy. Well, Jesus, of course, is the Holy One of God, and He reveals to us the character of God, and that's what God wants us to become like. That's really God's goal in redemption. Paul tells us in Romans 8, verse 29, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. What Paul means by that is that those whom God has loved from all eternity, he has predetermined to transform into the character of his son, into the image of his son, so that Jesus would be the firstborn, not the first one, but the one who would have preeminence, the one who would be the head, the one who would be the husband, okay, the head of a people, the husband of a bride who share his holiness, who are like him, who have his character. Now, that is the goal, but we understand from reading the Scriptures that it doesn't happen automatically. Yes, it's true when we trust in Christ, we are positionally sanctified, we are perfect in God's sight, but we know that practically there's a lot of cleanup to do, and that doesn't happen automatically. Uh, there's a lot of work involved, and God gives us various means to that end. Now, Jesus is the one who makes it possible. He gives to us His Holy Spirit through His obedience and His death. He sends the Holy Spirit. He purchases the Spirit, and He gives us the Spirit. But He also gives us the Word and prayer, praise, sacraments, and fellowship as the means to, to really accomplish this transformation by drawing our attention, as we've heard recently, to His glory. Now, first of all, it is our duty to use these means to draw near to Him. That, that's our obligation. You know, we, we need to be in these things. We need to be engaged in these things. Um, to be self-disciplined, to admonish ourselves, to correct ourselves, to encourage ourselves in, in the words. Um, there's really no substitute for this. But the point behind admonition is this, when we fail to do that, that's where we come in for each other, okay? It's also our duty, as we saw this morning, to encourage each other to keep pressing forward. Now, what I'd like to do is just revisit a few of the examples that we saw this morning, reading the text rather than just making reference to them, uh, to see several examples of this at work. Now, remember, Paul called the Ephesian elders to be on the alert. He reminded them that day and night for a period of three years, 
He didn't cease to admonish each one of them with tears. The reason was because he was concerned about what was going to happen to them after he left. Were they going to continue to walk with the Lord? He says this in verses 29 and 30 of Acts 20. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Paul knew that was going to happen. It, is, it happens virtually in, in every congregation, and that's why he kept the truth in front of them so that they would be able to recognize the errors when they come and avoid them, repel them, cleanse the church of these things. Job appears to have been God's instrument to do exactly the same thing. When Eliphaz said to him in Job 4, verses 3 through 4, he says, Behold, you have admonished many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have helped the tottering to stand, and you have strengthened feeble knees. I think what comes after that is, why haven't you, you know, healed yourself, right? But the point is that this is what Job was doing. He was... He was encouraging others to stand firm. When he saw those who were weak, to, he sought to strengthen them. So one of the, you know, one of the things that, that um, ad admonition is meant to do is to, is to make people, make, make our brothers and sisters, each one of us, firm, strong in the truth. Now, we need to recognize that the same, this same thing can happen even without false teachers. You know, there's more than enough sin within our own hearts to lead us astray. And so admonition is meant to keep us on the right path. And I, I might mention that um, that's exactly what the Lord is doing for us right now. He's admonishing us through His Word and through these, these examples to be aware that we can be led astray and to stay on the path by staying in His truth. We need to be in His truth and in the means. But secondly, admonition can also help us recover when we have fallen into sin. As I've said, it can also have a corrective element to it. When God's people went astray, as we saw this morning, He sent His prophets again and again to admonish them, to remind them of the covenant. And they've broken the covenant. They need to get back on track. So we read in Nehemiah 9, verses 25 through 26, Speaking of the fathers in the past, God's people in the past, he says, they captured fortified cities and a fertile land. They took possession of houses full of every good thing, hewn cisterns, vineyards, olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate, were filled, and grew fat, and reveled in your great goodness, but they became disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who had admonished them so that they might return to you. You see the corrective element in admonition. When you see somebody going astray. Well, that's what God sent the prophets to do, to admonish the people. We were reminded this morning, Nehemiah also admonished the people when he saw them disregarding one aspect of God's law, which was the Sabbath. I think it bears repeating because the Sabbath is something that is so almost entirely neglected today, even in the church and sadly, even in Reformed circles. In Nehemiah 13, verses 15 through 18, Nehemiah writes this, In those days I saw in Judah some who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads. And they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I admonished them on the day they sold food. Also men of Tyre were living there who imported fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. I don't know if you can catch the idea that Nehemiah is just shocked at what's going on here. Then I reprimanded the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing you were doing by profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do the same? So that our God brought on us and on this city all this trouble? 
Yet you are adding to the wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. I mean, they're again doing the very thing that caused them to go into exile in the first place. God had graciously brought them back into the land, but so quickly they forget and they turn away from the Lord. We also noted this morning Jeremiah as he writes about uh, the people of Judah. Uh, during the time, remember, if you, if you read Jeremiah, it, it should be fresh in your mind, but uh, he was warning God's people about the coming exile and that they should go into exile and, and not try to resist Nebuchadnezzar. But there were all these false prophets that were telling them, God is not going to allow you to be defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, stay in the land, fight. And Jeremiah was saying just the opposite. And so with all these false prophets telling the people the wrong thing. Jeremiah is standing to tell them the right thing, and he writes about the struggles that he had in this in the book of Lamentations, and he, he writes this in chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. How shall I admonish you? To what shall I compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? To what shall I liken you as I comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is as vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity, but they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. You notice the, the one thing, well, one thing that he's reproving the false prophets for doing is that they have not exposed your iniquity. That's what admonition is all about. So as he, as he thinks about what, what can I say, you know, to, to, to show you these things when there are so many others that are saying just the opposite. Well, point is, same thing's happening today. So many people are saying, go this way. The world is going this way. And as we know, admonition is not just for God's people, but it's also for those outside the church. Um, as Jay Adams would point out in his book, we need to admonish, warn, correct, even the unbeliever. And it's going to be hard for them to listen to us when the whole world is going the wrong direction. But God, of course, will use admonition to call his people to himself. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4.14, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved Children, remember the Corinthians had divided into parties. You know, some were favoring Paul, some Apollos, and some Peter. Paul was reminding them, you need to get your eyes on Christ, the one who actually laid down his life for you, not his servants. And nearly this entire letter is an admonition that was meant to heal these divisions. And then he wrote to the, or excuse me, the Thessalonians that they should have this same care. For each other, and remember, this is where one of the texts that we saw, besides verse 14 uh, in Romans 15, where we are called to do the, the same thing. He says, If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Admonition, again. Corrective. It's meant to keep us on the path. It's meant to get us back on the path when we get off the path. So we were redeemed by the Lord that we might become like Christ. This requires a great deal of effort on our own part for ourselves, but we are also to put effort into helping each other do the same thing. We need to encourage one another to keep going the right direction and also to get back on track when we stray. Now, I do believe in our text this evening, we see the Apostle Paul telling the Romans that the reason he wrote the letter was to, to do both of these things. But, you know, when you, when you read the letter, you don't see a lot of correction. I mean, there, there is correction, especially the, you know, the stronger, weaker brother section we've just gone through. But for the most part, I think it was to fortify them and to keep them, to ground them in the, in the truth, right? He, did say, he does say in verse 14, even though he was convinced that they had matured enough in their sanctification, in their love, in their knowledge, in their devotion to God, that they could you know, admonish each other, 
He says he still wrote this letter further to remind them, to speak boldly to them on certain points. Now, Paul, of course, wanted to make sure they understood the gospel firmly, but he also wanted to encourage them that the gospel gives them the power to live a godly life, and godliness is very important to him. So these two verses, I think, give to us something of Paul's purpose, his purpose statement for the letter. Not surprisingly, you know, John in his, well, in his gospel gives us the purpose for writing it at the very, well, close to the very end. And he does the same thing in his first letter. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, so this is a purpose statement. As a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, he wanted his offering of the Gentiles to be acceptable to God. And to be acceptable, they needed to be sanctified. They needed to be Christ-like. Uh, God is, we know, of two pure eyes to behold evil. God says that only the righteous may dwell with him. And Paul was writing to, uh, to accomplish this. And, and that's, again, we see the, that purpose throughout the book. I mean, he be, I'm just, by way of quick review, he did begin by explaining why they needed Christ, because they weren't holy. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is universal. And they're facing God's judgment because they have failed to obey God. But then he goes on to tell them what God has done to save sinners through the cross and how to receive that, how to be justified. They must trust in him and his grace alone by receiving Christ alone by faith. And then, of course, how having received the Lord Jesus Christ, they also have had the power of sin broken in their lives. They're no longer the slaves of sin, but now they are free to offer themselves to God. And then after explaining how God's plan for them fits in with his plan for the Jews, he went on to exhort them, encourage them to pursue holiness, the holiness for which they were saved. Offer yourselves up as living sacrifices to God. Now, what I'd like to emphasize at this point is the importance of sanctification. <laughs> I hope we understand. It's not optional, okay? Sanctification is not optional. The author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now, you've probably heard the expression, no holiness, no heaven. Now, it's not talking just about positional sanctification, although if you are positionally sanctified, you will be being sanctified personally. But we need to be being sanctified personally, okay? We are justified by the righteousness of Jesus alone, but it's true that no one who is justified, there is no one, I should say, who is justified, who isn't also sanctified Sanctification is the evidence of our justification. It's only those who are sanctified who are made practically holy, or at least in the process, who will be glorified in the end. Remember what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Remember what he also said to, to earlier on in, in, the, um, in the sermon. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. But let's not forget, even though outwardly they may look good, you know, whitewashed sepulchers, right? <laughs> they look good on the outside, but on the inside they were corrupt. If you truly love the Lord and you're serving Him, your righteousness will exceed theirs, even on a practical level, because their righteousness was filth, uh, you know, like a, mile, uh, a pile of dung. As, as Paul reflects on his own righteousness prior to coming to Christ, all my good works are just a mountain of dung. That's what their righteousness was like. Well, yours needs to be greater than that. It needs to be generated by a genuine love. And if you have that love, Paul is saying... Jesus is saying, the author to the Hebrews is saying, then you will do the will of the Father who is in heaven. Jesus says it's not enough to claim him as Lord. We also have to submit to him as Lord. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? 
So if we want to be assured that we are savingly trusting Jesus, we do need to see ourselves growing in sanctification and admonishment. Admonition helps that. This is an admonition. And it helps to remind us that we need to be sanctified. And that reminder helps us to pursue sanctification. And as we pursue sanctification and grow in Christ's likeness, I do believe that that strengthens our assurance that we belong to the Lord. We can't have any assurance unless we're looking to Christ. You know, he's the only source of, of assurance. But having looked to Him, there has to be a change in our lives. We have to see it. And uh, as we know, we're reminded again and again in Scripture to examine ourselves to make sure that there are certain virtues that are in us and that these things are growing. And if they are, if we see them, as um, Jonathan Edwards writes in his Religious Affections, if you can see the love of God in your heart, even if it's very weak, if you can see it, clearly know that, that that love is for God Himself and not just for His benefits, because He's holy then you can have that assurance. That is really what causes us to trust in Jesus. That's what causes us to, to embrace what God calls us to do. Our, our holy duty is because we love that holiness and that gives us assurance. So that's the benefit of admonition as it pushes us towards sanctification and as it does that, it, our assurance grows. But of course, there are other benefits to um, admonition as well and sanctification. Um, the more, obviously, we, we grow in holiness, the more we grow in love for the Lord, the more we grow in Christ-likeness, again, whose heart was a pure devotion to His Father, the more we're going to make the choices that Jesus would make if, if He were faced with the same choices. The more we're going to be doing the things that give honor to the Lord, the more we're going to serve Him Remember what the Puritans reminded us um, as we looked at that series by Dr. Reeves? We're only going to give ourselves to God to the degree that we love Him. And it's through the process of sanctification that we love Him more, that we grow in our love for Him. The more we're sanctified, the more also we're going to be able effectively to encourage each other to follow Christ, to admonish one another. And then finally, uh, sanctification. Uh, this, this is an Edwardsian, uh, you know, again, he had so many wonderful insights, but this is an Edwardsian point. Sanctification is something that will help us in, in this service um, by making us love the world less and heaven more. Uh, very, very important. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, this is not a direct quote, but this is the essence of what he said. When God saves us, he immediately begins the work of weaning us from the world. Okay, he shows us the corruption of the world. He shows us the vanity of the world, the emptiness of it, the worthlessness of it. And he begins to diminish that in our eyes and at the same time causes our affections, or you might say it's our, you know, causing our affections to head, you know, to go out towards God is maybe what brings us about, but our, he, he strengthens those affections for the Lord and for heaven by showing us His glory. And this is a process by which God prepares us for heaven. Uh, Jonathan Edwards used the term fit, okay? He, he fits us for heaven. That's preparing us, you know, detaching us in order to attach us from he detaches us from the world and from the things of the world that he may attach us to heaven. Now, the benefit of that is that the, the less we love this world and the more we love heaven, the more useful we're going to be to him here because the world is no longer going to become an encumbrance to us to get in our way. How is it that missionaries are able to give up all the comforts of Western culture and go into the bush in order to share Christ with, um, you know, more primitive cultures, you know? How can they do that? Well, it's because they don't love the world. They love Christ, and, and they love people. They love His elect. They're looking for His sheep, and, uh, 
And they're able to do that because, again, they're not so attached to the things of the world. And you know what Jesus told us um, before we should um, ever take up His mantle, His cross to follow after Him, is we have to be willing to die to ourselves. He also said, no one can be my disciple unless he gives up all his own possessions. Now, what do you think he meant by that? It's not necessarily that you liquidate everything and, and give it to charity, although he did call the rich man to do that because that was his God. But he does mean everything that I've given to you, again, you're a steward over, it belongs to me, and you need to have a loose hand on it because I may call you to do something with it, you know, for my glory. You need to be willing to do that. Well, that includes us, our time, our lives, but also all of our possessions. We need to have a loose grip on these things because they belong to the Lord, and we need to devote everything to Him. And Jesus is working that in us through the process of sanctification. And just that one verse, no one can be my disciple unless he gives up all his own possessions, is an admonition to us, a correction, a warning to us that we need to make sure that we have a loose grip on our possessions. So just to summarize what we've seen today, we, we are called to grow in our sanctification, in Christ-likeness. We are called to grow in goodness and love and knowledge so that we might admonish one another, encourage each other to stay on the path or to get back on the path if we happen to have strayed so that we might be more useful to Him and that our assurance of heaven might grow so that we'll have, again, a looser grip on the world and a tighter grip on heaven. It's for our good. Admonition is for our good, and we need to receive it as something good. We all need this loving pressure to move in the right direction. So may the Lord then give us the grace to press forward in these things that we might not only grow in them ourselves, but also be the means uh, to others to do the same. Well, let's, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord uh, to give us grace to do that.